Our next speaker is Dr. Vic Gura. And Dr. Gura is the founder of the Wearable Artificial Kidney, or WALK. He is also coming to us from Cedar sinai Hospital, where he has directly treated kidney patients and knows full well the burden of kidney disease on individuals and their families. And this is why he has been a champion and an innovator of artificial wearable organs and artificial wearable kidneys. Dr. Gurr understands that treatments must align with the aspirations of patients. And that's why he has taken so much of his personal time and resources and invested them in solutions that are tailored for patients. Dr. Gurr is joining us by video in a rebroadcast of a presentation that he gave to AAKP late last year. This broadcast has been extremely popular with patients around the world, and it provokes some pretty interesting questions about the feasibility of wearable kidneys, how patients are demanding solutions that are not in a dialysis center, and the great work that's being done by engineers and modelers around the world in efforts similar to Dr. Gurr's to try to bring this solution to bear for patients. Dr. Gurr, go right ahead. I would like to uh, thank AAKP and uh, the University of George W. Uh, AAKP is a wonderful organization and it's a very uh, good channel for all the patients uh, to have some say or some organized input uh, on the uh, issues that are affecting them and the rest of the nephrology community. So uh, I think uh, that uh, the folks that uh, take the time uh, and their efforts to do that are doing a fantastic job. I also uh, want to th uh, thank Dr. Uh, Raj Dominic uh, from the University of Washington for uh, his leadership in doing a great organization and a great nephrology division. Uh, let's get started now uh, with my disclosures. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, a wearable artificial kidney, why do we need it? How does it work? Does it really do the job? Uh, and those are the main questions I will uh, ask, I'll try to answer. Why do we need it? Uh, when I'm in a room telling a patient uh, that dialysis is necessary, uh, it's a very difficult time for me, uh, for the patient and the families, their uh, friends that are around, hopefully, uh, in, in this difficult situation. And the questions that usually can, uh, come up are, what can I expect? How long do I have before I'm gone? Does it hurt? Can I work? Do I need help? Who's going to pay for this? And my answers, the answers of any practicing nephrology for these questions, are unfortunately not very good. So uh, what are the met needs in dialysis and what are we trying to accomplish? We want to reduce the mortality, improve the quality of life, reduce the cost, improve access to the technology and make life and uh, care more simple because it's a quite complicated endeavor uh, that inconvenience the life of the patients when they have to start doing this. So here is a list of all the many problems that affect the life of a patient when they are on the on dialysis uh, with uh, uh, sitting on the chair doing time, the pill burden of swallowing a large amount of pills, uh, fluid restriction. If they drink too much, we have to remove a lot. If we remove a lot, they cramp. If we don't remove enough they choke with water in their lungs, they go a lot to the hospital. Uh, most of the patients on dialysis uh, are fatigued, are disabled and cannot hold the job and be gainfully employed and most of them have problems with even doing their activities of daily life. So uh, these are things we want to solve uh, in a wonderful uh, document called the uh, Roadmap for Improvements on Dialysis that has been developed in the community. Uh, these issues are clearly stated and are the uh, guidance of we need to solve these things. And uh, I can tell you here now that the WAC uh, solves uh, 
most if not all of these are quite successful uh, and I hope I will make that point now. Uh, in the roadmap uh, we want to uh, have a uh, improved volume control, no sodium retention, less hypertension, no hyperkalemia, no uh, metabolic acidosis, improved serum albumin, improved sleep patterns, uh, we want to uh, reduce or eliminate the need for pills and phosphate binders, improve appetite and nutrition, decrease need for blood pressure drugs, and decrease morbidity and mortality. Well, this was written by a kidney doctor. But if you ask the patients, the order in which these things uh, are spelled out is a little different. Uh, patients will want more quality of life. Uh, they want... Uh, they care more about how they live whatever time they have than uh, not necessarily how long they have. We have to respect that as uh, kidney doctors, uh, but the idea is that as a physician, I confess that's what I am, uh, I believe that if we address these issues, uh, each one of them, when it gets solved, then quality of life improves. And I'll, I'll discuss that a, a little bit further. So lately people say, well, why don't we do this at home? And if we do it at home, uh, people will be better off. And um, if we uh, also would uh, dialyze more frequently uh, longer, uh, we can uh, improve quality of life. But the way uh, dialysis is structured today, uh, you simply cannot do more dialysis if, unless you're doing it at home. And uh, if you live in Beverly Hills with uh, five bedrooms and two people, uh, you can definitely put uh, more than one machine in your house. But if we are five people in two bedrooms, then it becomes a little, becomes a little bit more complicated. So uh, those of us that sit around saying, oh, we have to do more dialysis at home, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, it's simply uh, not doable to the extent that uh, the powers to be and the organizations want us to because the technology doesn't allow it. You need more rooms, you need more space, you need the uh, water. Um, uh, many people want uh, somebody to assist them because the technology is a uh, is complicated or because they don't feel very well uh we're doing it and they want somebody around and we don't have enough nurses and technicians and uh, if we want to expand uh, the um, the uh, amount of dialysis uh, chairs available in dialysis units uh, there's no uh, political or budgetary uh, ability uh, to simply double the amount of dialysis clinics that we have so people can come more open. Let alone the fact that patients don't even want to go to uh, more often to a dialysis unit to begin with. They want their life back to do what they want to do instead of sitting around in, uh, in a chair. So we said, well, how can we solve this? And I've shown this slide many times and uh, forgive me for being repetitive, but this makes the point. Uh, if we dialyze, a comp if we uh, miniaturize things like uh, the clock to the wristwatch uh, and the big uh, uh, computer to a more powerful device that is in the palm of your hand with a smartphone, we should convert a big machine that weighs a couple of hundred pounds, uh, is a, uh, operated with a, an electrical outlet and requires 40 gallons of water per treatment into something that people walk around with. So we did that. And uh, we went from a uh, the large machine to a belt that uh, you could walk around with and work the batteries. So this belt worked with a blood in red that comes uh, through a pump into the dialyzer and then in blue it goes back into the patient. Uh, the dialysate in green goes into the dialyzer, comes out in yellow. It's uh, regenerated and purified through those yellow circles 
that contain chemicals that cleans the dialy the dialysate and it keeps going in a loop this way instead of using 40 gallons of water we went to 300 cc's and this was the diagram of the work in its second version version 2.0 this is version one uh, that was trialed in an animal in Cedar sinai uh, this is version two and the first human trial was done in italy with professor ronco in blue uh, and in the middle you have a patient that, that was strolling in the park uh, and um, uh, this is a little park uh, in the Vicenza Hospital uh, where Professor uh, Ronco works and uh, in the slide above, uh, in the picture above on your right, you can see mother and daughter both on dialysis, mother with a, a regular dialysis machine like we have today and a daughter with the version 2.0 of the uh, wearable artificial kidney. The second human trial was done in uh, the United Kingdom uh, and uh, we have uh, patients that uh, are wearing the device and walking around uh, with the tie on there is the late uh, Hans Dietrich Polasek, a most gifted engineer that mentored us and helped us a lot to bring the work to where it is today uh, and uh, Professor uh, Andrew Davenport, uh, the gentleman with the uh, butterfly tie, and uh, he uh, was another uh, great mentor in collaboration that we are very successful to collaborate with. And then uh, we did the first FDA trial uh, in Seattle uh, with the help of uh, Jonathan Himmelfarb and a wonderful team in University of Washington and here is the first uh, human being uh, first human beings in the United States and the first woman in the United States uh, uh, dancing with a wearable artificial kidney while getting dialysis not sitting in a chair not attached to anything and this is the WAC 2.0 so this is the WAC 2.0 and when we use it, uh, patients told us it's too heavy, it's 11 pounds, it's still not small enough. And uh, although we were very happy with the lady uh, in the blue box in the, in the bottom, in the sense that uh, we proved that the concept is doable, but there were still ways to go because patients were still not willing to walk around uh, with this device uh, and uh, and move around so we learned in london that our uh, in eight hours we removed uh, all the uh, uh, toxin uh, indicators uh, that we needed to remove quite efficiently in eight hours and uh, we removed enough urea and creatinine uh, over eight hours so we said well if we can do this over eight hours uh why do we need uh, more equipment to keep removing this over 24. so we went back to the drawing board and we said we're going to have a day version in which we remove the heavy components uh that uh, you can see uh here on the uh, uh on the bottom and uh, we went uh from 11 pounds to two pounds. To that end, we also had to improve uh, the uh, device uh, on your left is the old uh, WAC pump from the version 2.0 that gave us a lot of technical problems. So uh, we kept going to the um, uh, version uh, three and that in the middle is pump three of 18 pumps we kept building and improving until we came to what you see on the right hand side where we have a uh, the latest version of the WAC pump which is fundamentally different from what we had in the 2.0 and uh, it showed us gave us a lot of advantages uh, in, uh, in in how the uh, device performs so going to the drawing board 
we said, okay, uh, how do we make this uh, smaller and more convenient for the patient? So this is one of the several sketches that we're starting to re redo the work from the 2.0 to the 3.0. And uh, we came up with a version, a daily version that you, you wear around during the day. It weighs two, point, uh, two pounds only, but it has a, um, a blood coming from uh, the uh, patient, from the catheter into the dialyzer and going back. And the dial dialysate goes into one a canister of sorbents and then it goes back to the uh, to the dialyzer in a circle and this bag that contains the excess fluid that is removed is out of the bed and um, we'll show you what happens when this is outside of the belt but still hooked up so during the night the belt hooks up uh, to uh, the three containers of um, of chemicals that uh, do the job that needs to be done in eight hours. So these three guys uh, work over eight hours uh, to do what they need to do. Thanks to the new pump, uh, our uh, rate of removal uh, of fluids is going to be much more effective. And then we started to play around with different models uh, on how this is going to look, looking at different things that people put on their own bodies. We looked at the uh, belts that people put things in, uh, and we even looked at a dialysis patient that hopefully might have a wearable kidney uh, on a backpack and go fishing. Uh, I do not believe that the 3.0 will allow you to do that. Uh, maybe another iteration but at least I want you to know that we were thinking of how we do uh, return to the patients in normal life where you can go fishing if you want to. Uh, you can go, uh, I'm not sure I can uh, bring the work to scuba diving uh, with it, with the work on, but that doesn't mean uh, we cannot try. And we look at different models of things that people put in their bodies to carry things, uh, from a holster to carry a gun, uh, to uh, uh, vests that can be worn in the field. Uh, and uh, we even uh, looked at different possibilities as where in the body you put what. And at all times, what we wanted is to give patients normalcy on how to do things. So we do it. We did mock of a mock of the work in its version 3.0. And here we have one of our beloved designers. This is Lance, who did a fantastic job, and you'll see that. And we look how can we give normalcy so you can move around, walk around with this, hopefully wear it under your shirt. Uh, so it's not obvious for people to see this. Many patients have expressed that they don't want to be seen uh, with the device on their body walking around and people pointing fingers. We have to respect that. So with that in mind, uh, we work a lot to see how we can uh, make it not only light but discreet to allow normalcy. And we try to figure out where do we put what. So I told you that the waste bag with the pump that puts the waste into that bag are out of the belt. So they hook up here, but they can go in your pocket or in a table when you don't want to remove fluids. So this gives to the patients uh, the ability to remove fluid if and when they want to. So uh, it, it gives uh, flexibility and choices uh, to how to do this. And I'll explain that uh, about the choices a little bit further. So this is uh, one model, mock model that we produced with our designers of how the wearable will go. And you may notice that the parts are to the sides. So uh, the uh, person wearing this can bend forward uh, without the impediment of these uh, things in their belly. 
and uh, we do need some suspenders so this doesn't fall and you may notice that the catheter with blood uh, even though it's placed in the chest like usually it's tunneled under the skin and goes and exits here so you don't have a line of blood uh, that can get entangled with things and then you can open this and remove components uh, as we would train the patients to do and this is very easy so it doesn't need a lot of manual dexterity or issues and uh, the fluid removal uh, is done by a little pump with a bag and you can roll the bag when it's empty and put this in your pocket now uh, if you uh, have a, uh, an elder uh, patient uh, in, a, in a nursing home, it doesn't really matter too much. But if you're working in your office, uh, you can hook this thing up here and remove fluid. Uh, then you want to go to Starbucks, you unhook this. The bag is now full. You go to the bathroom, empty the bag. You have your coffee and this is not hooked up so you have this weight on you and you can go to the bank or to your Starbucks or to walk in the park and then you come back to your office and you hook this back and keep removing fluid so it gives patients choices on uh, according to their lifestyle if you have an elder patient uh, in, in, a, uh, in a nursing home probably it doesn't matter too much but if you're an active person that wants to have a significant life and do significant work uh, then this is a great advantage uh, this is an elder patient in this modeling uh, that hooks up the night module during the night when he is asleep but this lovely guy is here watching tv removing fluid uh, when he's at home and then when he decides that he needs to take his uh, stroll in the park or uh, go to the bank he takes this off and when he comes back home he removes through it again and for the purpose of showing you this we have to do it uh, above the shirt but we will strive to make it small enough so it goes under the t-shirt under the dress under the garment so they don't have to uh, uh, be exposed uh, to uh, other people noticing this if they don't want to. People may choose to uh, wear the device like this and it allows a quite significant amount of activity. Uh, for uh, elder patients, uh, you can, if you're younger enough and you hold the, uh, your, um, your work under your um, uh, under your t-shirt as opposed to above the t-shirt but if it would be under your t-shirt you wouldn't see this and uh you know you can go and uh, take a hike so to speak and at night you can put it uh, with a, a night module inside a pillow or a teddy bear and uh, what are the advantages that we have for uh, these patients i mean so okay it looks nice does it do the job so uh this is a table that would take me a, a long time uh to uh, uh to discuss but the advantages is that we remove enough fluid so patients can drink whatever they want whenever they want and uh, we can remove it they can eat all the salt they want because this thing removes enough salt so you can add salt uh, to have a normal meal. Uh, we have shown in all the trials we've done so far that we remove enough phosphorus to move uh, to make uh, phosphate binders obsolete. So you don't need phosphate binders, and this has uh, more than one profound effect. And if you don't have fluid overload and you don't have a salt overload. Uh, it stands to reason that they will not have swelling of the legs, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, and go less to the hospital. Uh, you don't need needles that are painful, and most patients I know don't enjoy getting two thick needles uh, stuck in their arms at all times. 
so uh, those are some of the uh, many advantages of this device. So patients can eat whatever they want. This lady was wearing uh, the uh, work in Seattle, but she could eat pizza, French fries, and drink cola to her heart's content. Uh, this is a trial of WAC 2.0, and you can eat a banana or cheesecake. Uh, this uh, lovely guy is walking around eating whatever he wanted and no need for phosphate binders. Uh, let's talk about money. As stated by our good friend Eli Friedman, uh, the world cannot afford end-stage uh, renal disease. It's unsustainable. And some of the uh, economic advantages of the, of the device we're bringing uh, in front of you is a savings of whatever the last time we, we looked at this is already close to six and a half billion a year in just making a phosphate binders obsolete. Uh, the charges for phosphate binders are about $900 per month. And if you do the math today, you go uh, to six and a half billion in savings just in making one drug alone obsolete. So uh, we would have uh, less uh, uh, hospitalizations, less hypertension, less cardiovascular disease, no phosphate binders, and a numerous amount of economic advantages with this device. So this lady would be wearing this under her shirt. And we went from uh, uh, where dialysis is today to the 2.0 to what we would like uh, to see in the future. Uh, and this is what we are doing, not in the distant future. This is what we're building as we speak. Uh, hopefully the trial of the device uh, similar to what you see in this picture will occur still this year. And uh, this is not a, uh, the brainchild of Victor Gura. There are numerous uh, excellent scientists, technicians, nurses, physicians that have been collaborating uh, over a very long pathway uh, to bring this to where we are today. And this is my time to thank them and you for listening.